If you're new to astrophotography, it can be pretty overwhelming to know where to start. But before you buy that first scope, there's a few things you need to know. Hi, I'm Daniel Zalero. I'm an astrophotographer who loves exploring our universe with a telescope and a camera, and I want to bring you along for the journey, so be sure to click that subscribe button. 2020 was an exciting year for me. It was my first full year doing astrophotography and I learned a lot of things along the way. Comet Neowise made its appearance along with the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn made great opportunities for astrophotographers. And so the popularity of astrophotography has skyrocketed this last year, inspiring a lot of people to try astrophotography for themselves. So you jump on the internet and you start looking at telescopes and cameras. And one of two things will happen. A, you buy a telescope without knowing anything about them and you've got no idea what to do with it. Or B, you jump on to some of the astrophotography groups and astrophotography forums and you ask that question that a lot of beginners ask, what camera and telescope should I start with? And often for beginners, the answers that you get just leave you really confused because some of the expert astrophotographers will start giving you answers like, you should buy a German equatorial mount with at least double the payload capacity of the weight of your telescope. You need to get a scope that's got proper sampling for the pixel size of your camera sensor using Nyquist sampling theory. And it's at that point that you begin to realize maybe astrophotography is more than just putting a camera on a telescope. Now, I can't tell you what equipment you should start with because there's just too many things that go into it. But what I can do is I can give you some information that will equip you to know where you need to start what the best option for you might be. And the first thing that I can help you with is understanding the different types of astrophotography. First off, we've got wide field astrophotography. Shots of the Milky Way in the night sky are a great example of what wide field is. Another example would be like this shot that I took of the Orion constellation. Wide field is typically done with a wide angle camera lens on up to a medium telephoto camera lens. I use the Rokinon 16mm f2 lens and I also use the Rokinon 135mm f2 lens for my wide shots. Then we've got deep space astrophotography. This is typically what I would think most people think about. It's what I think about when I think about astrophotography. It's those pictures of nebulae and galaxies and star clusters things like that that are out in the night sky. For deep space shots, you're going to want a little bit longer focal length lens, or this is where you start to use telescopes. And most often deep space imaging is done using a mount that can track the movement of the stars so that you can get longer exposures. And then you've got imaging of objects that are in our solar system, such as the planets, the moon and the sun. Lunar imaging can be done with a wide variety of different optics to get a really wide field landscape shot with the moon in it where you can go really long focal length and get close-up shots of the craters on the surface of the moon. Planets are also going to be done with a really long focal length telescope. Those awesome shots of the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn are a great example of what planetary imaging is. Planet conjunctions don't happen very often, so if you want to get a great shot of something like that, you really need to plan it out by looking at a calendar of future astronomical events. And lastly, we've got solar imaging. Solar imaging is very similar to planetary and lunar imaging, except that you're gonna need specialized filters to capture the sun. Two of the most common ones that you're gonna see would be a white light filter, and another one would be a hydrogen alpha filter. And these are specially made for imaging the sun, so that you don't damage your eyes, you don't damage your telescope, and you don't damage your camera.
Now, when it comes to deep space astrophotography, you can also uh, subcategorize it into two different things, broadband and narrowband. Broadband photos are simply taken using the light from the visible spectrum, like what we see with, with our own eyes, while narrowband is accomplished by using special narrowband filters that filter out all other light except for the wavelengths that they allow to come through. So depending on whether you want to do broadband imaging or narrowband imaging, that's also a consideration into the types of gear that you want to look into getting. Let's talk a little bit about the processing that goes into making one of those images. The simplest form of astrophotography would be just taking a single image, a single photo. Typically, this only works with wide field images or very bright objects in the night sky. So is there a problem then with taking just single images? If you're happy with the result, then that's what matters. But if you want better images, then stacking long exposures is going to help you reduce the noise in your photo, it's going to help get more vibrant color, and it's also going to help you get sharper details. Even wide field images of the Milky Way will greatly benefit from stacking. But there's a lot of objects out in the night sky that you're not even going to see with a single photo. You're going to need lots of long exposure stacked together to even be able to begin to see that object in your photo. So how is stacking accomplished? When you take an astrophoto, photons of light from your target will hit your camera sensor. This is called signal and is represented by the words in these images. The problem is that one photo cannot capture enough signal to make a full picture. But when you add all the signal together, you get a clearer picture of your object. But your exposures will also have noise in them. So the amount of noise versus the amount of signal you get is called the signal to noise ratio. So stacking multiple long exposures will help you increase your signal to noise ratio, which will also brighten your target and reduce the noise in your photo. You can also use something called calibration frames. These will help you to get rid of certain types of camera noise, correct optical big netting, and also remove shadows caused by dust on the camera sensor. Then you're gonna put all of these photos in software such as Deep Sky Stacker or PixInsight. Software made for stacking is gonna take all of the photos that you took and all of the calibration frames that you took, and then it's going to average them together so that you get to keep the good signal from your deep sky object while also rejecting the noise signals so that you can make a raw stacked image file. Stacking lunar, solar, and planetary images is going to work a little bit differently than long exposure stacking. This is often called lucky imaging. The first problem is that these objects are too bright for long exposures and are going to end up way oversaturated. The second issue is that turbulence in our atmosphere makes the solar system objects look wavy and warped. So a single short exposure is not gonna work either. The solution is to take a high frame rate video of solar system objects with very short exposures and then use a program like AutoStacker, which is gonna analyze each frame in the video to find the best frames for stacking. Now we take the stacked image file and we begin what's called post-processing. This is going to transform it into that beautiful night sky photo that we're after. This often includes stretching your data, removing gradients such as light pollution, balancing the color of the background and your target image, and also further reducing the noise in the image. So hopefully now you've got a decent understanding of the different types of astrophotography and you've got a little bit of an understanding of what processing goes into making those images. Now let's talk about some of the different setups that you can use for all these different types of astrophotography. Some people would say that using a cell phone is not real astrophotography, 
but modern cell phone cameras can take pretty decent shots nowadays. And you can even take multiple exposures and calibration frames for stacking. Here's an example that I did using my Samsung S10 camera. Using a DSLR with a wide angle lens is a great way to start taking nice wide field images of the Milky Way. This is how I started. And don't be afraid to use the kit lens if that's all you have. It won't produce the sharpest images, but it will get you started. Now, depending on the focal length of your wide angle lens, you can expect to take exposures typically around five to 20 seconds before you start to see star trailing in your frames. The tripod or mount that you use is also a very important thing to consider not only for wide field DSLR imaging, but for all types of astrophotography. Cheap tripods and ball heads will not be able to hold your camera steady enough for long exposures and your frames just are not going to look good. Telescopes and mounts made for visual observing can also be used for some types of astrophotography. Many of these visual astronomy setups use what's called an alt as mount. They move in a horizontal and vertical motion, which is what makes them easier to use for observing with an eyepiece. The issue is that these Altaz mounts, even the motorized ones, don't track the stars smoothly enough for long exposures of deep sky objects. If you already have a setup like this, then you can take photos of the moon and planets and maybe even really bright deep sky objects like the Orion Nebula. The basic entry level to equatorial tracking mounts would be the portable star tracker, such as the Star Adventurer Pro or the Ioptron Sky Tracker Pro. You can use these with a DSLR and lens, although some can even handle the weight of a small refractor. Using a small star tracker like these will enable you to lengthen your exposures to around one to two minutes, give or take, depending on the weight and focal length of your optics. For true long exposure astrophotography, you're going to want to get a mount that can properly track the movement of the stars as the Earth rotates. This is called an equatorial mount. An equatorial mount rotates on an axis that is parallel with the rotation axis of the Earth, which allows for much longer exposures. This works by aligning the right ascension axis with the North Star, which is called polar alignment. This brings us to what many would consider a full astrophotography setup. A full setup consists of a telescope, a full equatorial tracking mount, and a camera. Other imaging accessories are also used, such as guide scopes or off-axis guiders, filters, and focal reducers or field flatteners. With an equatorial tracking mount, there's a variety of different telescopes out there that you can use for imaging. And that's one of the things that makes it hard to get started with astrophotography because ultimately a lot of it does come down to personal preference. And if you've never done this before, then you don't have any personal preferences. A really good option for you would be to go to a local astronomer Astronomy club if you've got one. Meet people that have different types of setups so you can get a first-hand look at them and you can get an idea of what might work best for you. But I want you to understand this too. You don't need a bunch of fancy gear to get started in astrophotography. Taking images of the Milky Way with a DSLR camera on a tripod is a perfectly great way to start this hobby and many of us who've been doing this for a while that's exactly how we started. However, the ability to produce better quality images as you progress in this hobby are going to require more of your investment in time and money. 